Hi everyone, uh, welcome to the day 7 of uh, PM Mini Astro Workshop Series 2020. So today we have uh, Shivan Kuller who is currently uh, doing his uh, PhD from the University of Toronto uh, and previously he completed his Masters in Physics and uh, BA in Electronics and Instrumentation from Bitspil and KK Berla Goa campus. Uh, and during his undergrad, he has worked on uh, various topics ranging from uh, star formation thresholds from observations uh, and a little bit on uh, gravitational decoherence, uh, wherein he briefly looked at uh, theory of quantum decoherence, uh, Arnaud Bohm effect, quantum field theory in curved space time, uh, and he has finally written a small code to uh, calculate. Uh, the form factor for a given path configuration. Uh, I don't think we'll hear on that, but it's a very interesting idea. Uh, and he has also worked on uh, uh, this modeling of uh, masses in the galaxy uh, using the hydrogen 21 centimeter line observations uh, and also the size distribution of uh, uh, H2 regions during reionization using uh, granulometry. So, and apart from this, he has also has two publications, uh, one on the topic uh, determining star formation uh, thresholds from observations, and the second publication on probing the uh, high redshift intergalactic medium with hyperfine transitions of uh, he, uh, helium plus uh, three ionized helium. And he has also got two awards to during his PhD, uh, where he just started at University of Toronto. One from the Department of Astronomy and Astrophysics of University of Toronto uh, for uh, with the title International Entrance Award. And apart from that, he has also got an award from the University of Toronto for towards his PhD on uh, International Graduate Student Fellowship for Excellence in Doctoral Studies. And Today, the speaker will be talk, introducing what star formation is, what the physics behind is, why one should have, uh, also, uh, like he's going to talk about the importance of star formation too. So this is part of uh, two talks that are going to be take place on star formation. So this will be the part one of star formation and part two of star formation will be tomorrow, uh, which will be a kind of follow up to this. Uh, I think with that, uh, Shivan, you can kick it off. Okay, thanks Surinder for the lovely introduction. And thanks to all the organizers for also organizing uh, this uh, workshop. Uh, it's a very nice endeavor. And thanks everyone for coming to this talk. Uh, I know it's Sunday evening, not the best time perhaps, but um, I'm glad you, can you could make it. Today I'm going to talk about star formation in our universe and how we go from interstellar gas to stellar gas. So let's start. Uh, I want to begin by showing you my attempt at classifying um, the types of objects in astrophysics. So there's mainly three size scales and three types of objects planets, stars, and galaxies, and everything else, almost everything else, is either a collection of these objects or it's a stage in their formation, evolution, and um, death. Okay, so people have focused on white dwarfs, neutron stars, and black holes uh, in previous lectures, and we'll also do that in uh, future ones. But these dead stars, so to say, are excellent laboratories to study some uh, fundamental physics. Like you can understand stuff about GR, nuclear physics, condensed matter physics, and string theory uh, using white dwarfs, neutron stars, and black holes as your laboratories. But today we're going to focus on how stars form star formation. And the objects that we're focusing on mainly are giant molecular clouds and protoplanetary disks. So I hope you can, there's some lag, but yeah, I hope you can see now. Yeah. 
So these giant molecular clouds, I'll describe what they are in detail later, but um, these are fantastic um, objects in their own right. Fascinating uh, images are seen of these objects. And star formation uh, involves the study of giant molecular clouds, protoplanetary disks, and also star clusters because these three things go hand in hand. Protoplanetary disks are what you get when stars, uh, you know, gas collapses into stars and they form disks where planets form. So baby planets are found in protoplanetary disks. That's why you get the name. Um, and star formation is intricately linked to planet formation, galaxy formation and evolution. You can't um, study, you, you, whenever you study anything about star formation, you also learn uh, a lot about planet formation and how galaxies form and evolve. Uh, protoplanetary disks and molecular clouds, they're fantastic laboratories because of the extreme environment. Uh, they're fantastic laboratories to study fundamental physics topics like fluid mechanics turbulence, plasma physics, thermodynamics, chemistry, um, and star clusters and star systems like planetary systems, solar systems can be used to study end body systems, celestial end body dynamics, celestial mechanics and chaos and so on. So my talk today is gonna be in three main sections. First, understanding the circumstances surrounding stellar birth. Next, we focus on how do we systematically study star formation and then what do we not understand at the end? And I'll end with some open questions uh, that people are still trying to understand. So starting off with the first question, where does star formation occur? So star formation occurs in these giant molecular clouds as you can see on the image on the right, these are huge clumps of mostly molecular hydrogen that span across a few parsecs to a few kiloparsecs. And one parsec is about 3.26 light years. So these are really big structures. And also in terms of AU, it's like two into 10 power five or six AUs. Uh, AU stands for astronomical unit. I'm sure people have heard of, heard of that before. And these clouds are roughly 10 to the four to 10 to the eight solar masses in terms of their mass. That's 10,000 times the mass of the sun at the least. And these clouds are also very cold. The temperature is around 10 Kelvin. And the sound speed in these regions is around 200 meters per second. Um, that's close to what it is in air on the earth, right? An important thing uh, to note here is that these clouds are made up of mostly molecular hydrogen and molecular hydrogen at 10 Kelvin doesn't have any molecules that are capable of producing emission that we can see. So these clouds are pretty much invisible. But how do we see something that's invisible? So what we do is we use infrared imaging. So if you look at the image on the right, that's taken by an infrared telescope called Spitzer, Spitzer Space Telescope. And, and the reason that we use infrared is because you don't, you can't, since you can't see the gas uh, or S2 in the gas, um, there's you can try to look at look for other things. Uh, so there are often dust grains that are also found in these giant molecular clouds. And what these dust grains do is they absorb optical light from the stars and then reprocess it and emit it in terms of their own thermal emission at some other wavelength that is seen in the infrared. So the image that you see here, this whole thing is actually a dust cloud. 
all of this is mostly dust. But if you want to look at gas, what we can do is we can look at other tracer molecules. What these are, are molecules that are often found with hydrogen in these giant molecular clouds at around 10 Kelvin and have some emission uh, that we can observe. So molecules that we typically use are carbon monoxide, ammonia, and hydrogen cyanide. So that's how we image, image gas. Uh, if you look at this figure over here, this is all the CO emission or carbon monoxide emission from a nearby galaxy. Um, and you can see these green areas, they just um, tell you where the gas in, or where the GMCs in these galaxies are. But what do we do about stars? How do we see the stars or young stars that form? So for that, we look at stuff in near infrared. Um, dust usually takes up the far infrared and mid infrared, and you can still see uh, stars in the near infrared. And if you also want to look at where stars formed or on the galactic scales, you can look at H alpha emission. Uh, what these, what this emission is, is due to, so for example, if you have a star that forms somewhere, uh, that star will produce starlight and it will create a bubble around itself, which blows away all the, all the gas um, that it formed from, and you will have an ionized region. These are called H2 regions. H2 stands for singly ionized hydrogen. And when the electrons that are ionized, when they recombine with protons, so electrons plus protons, they form hydrogen atoms again and also produce emission that we can see. And that is what is shown on the figure in the bottom right. So this is showing all the H alpha emission in a nearby galaxy. Okay, hopefully uh, that was all clear. There are of course limitations to each of these methods, each of these tracers. Um, not all, you, you don't always find carbon monoxide in all density ranges. Um, and you have to use sort of uh, different types of molecules to get a complete picture. Uh, of your giant molecular cloud. This is uh, an image of the Carina Nebula. Uh, the Carina Nebula is one of the most massive star forming regions in our, uh, in the nearby galaxy or in the solar neighborhood or just what we can see from the sky. Uh, you can see here the, the, length, the length scale here is like four parsecs. Uh, so this image spans across roughly, say, 15 parsecs. Uh, but actually, this is only a part. Carina Nebula is actually around 100 parsecs across in total. So uh, it's really big. There are all, all sorts of interesting things going on in this image. You have, oops, you have the Keyhole Nebula over here. You have dust pillars which are formed by starlight impinging upon gas and dust and shaping or sculpting these pillars. There's a star here and there's no gas, it looks like, or no dust. Uh, so this is like an H2 region perhaps. And then there's also stuff over here, which is a stellar jet. So there's some star forming that produces these jets and outflows, which I will come to later on. And there's also this interesting star known as Eta Carina, which is something called a luminous blue variable. It's a star that undergoes very violent, unpredictable eruptions from time to time. And it doesn't, it's, it's very poorly understood. Um, and people are still trying to figure out uh, what these types of objects are. 
but we're not focusing on that today. We're focusing more on the physics and, uh, that describes these regions. Here is an image of what happens when you have gas that gets very dense and starts to collapse and uh, compress, and then eventually it forms a protoplanetary disk. You have a star at the center, and you have this amazing looking disk, uh, which is probably around uh, 100 or 1000 AU or something like that. Uh, and this was this is a famous image that uh, was in the news recently because the authors of this paper they claimed that they could see that it was like a detection of the first I don't know if it's the first but uh, it's a baby planet over here uh, that's what they claim but people have also shown that uh, in other papers that it could also be a star not a planet that's forming. Oh. Where is the baby planet again? We couldn't see. Oh, over here in E1. Or whatever. It's F1, sorry. Okay. So now coming to the motivation behind understanding uh, how star formation works. Uh, it's, I'm going to divide this into into two parts, one from the astronomy side or astrophysics side. Uh, so it's important to understand how galaxy and planet formation work. And so we need to, all these three subjects are kind of interlinked together. Um, there's also some interesting uh, topic topics in star formation. One of them is the IMF or the initial mass function of stars which is basically if you plot the histogram of the masses of the stars, so mass on the x-axis in terms of solar masses and the number of stars in each bin as um, the y-axis. Uh, and these masses are the masses of stars at their birth, um, sort of when they occupy the main sequence or when they just come to the main sequence, I think uh, Amon has covered topics on stellar evolution. So I won't be going into that. Um, but the IMF is a very interesting thing. It's often referred to as the holy grail of astrophysics. Um, and it looks like a distribution that's sort of a log normal shape, has a peak somewhere and then follows a power law. So that's Beside the point though, um, what is important to take away is that the IMF is important for stellar cluster evolution and galaxy evolution. And that's because you have, uh, when you have massive stars, these massive stars produce a lot of uh, starlight and they dominate the galaxy's budget. They are short or light budget. They are short lived um, and they have, and the number of massive stars you have in a star cluster determines uh, how many supernova events you will get and how many stellar remnants you will get in terms of white dwarfs, black holes, or neutron stars, and what the merger rates of these neutron star black hole pairs would be, uh, and so on. So it's important uh, in terms of the evolution of uh, star clusters and galaxies on the whole. Okay. So now that we've kind of figured out where star formation occurs, well, we want to look at what is the physics that describes these regions. So if we think about it, typical stellar densities, like our sun, it's about one gram per centimeter cube. Typical ISM density is about 10 to the minus 22 or 24, it should be minus 22 or so. Um, so there's like 20 orders of magnitude that gas has to uh, go through. So it needs to compress and um, get to these very dense stellar objects called stars. And well, if you think about it, maybe things just sort of clump together in a GMC and you eventually get stars. Uh, while that 
picture is kind of correct. Um, it's not a complete picture. Uh, it is certainly that it is certain that you, when you have a lot of mass in some region, you will also have uh, a lot of uh, self gravity because of that of that region, and it will attract more and more uh, gas towards it, and it will get even denser and even denser. It's called an instability, and specifically the the genes instability, or gravitational instability, and you will eventually lead that will eventually lead to collapse where things just get denser and denser until you form stars when you uh, have gas that is hot enough so when you reach temperatures of about 10 to the 7 kelvin you can start to fuse hydrogen in the interiors of stars okay but as i described that picture is not actually that simple there's a lot of complications and one of them is that this whole cloud that you saw it actually is a fluid and there's a difference between liquids and fluids it's important not to confuse the two gases can also be fluids and liquids can also be fluids uh, and being a fluid just means that you follow the fluid dynamics equations okay and, and i'll come to that in a minute uh, what is important to note here is that uh, we describe something as a fluid or it can be treated as a fluid when the mean free path of the atoms or particles in that fluid is much much smaller than your system size and what i mean by the mean free path is say you have an electron at some position uh, what is the distance that it travels before hitting another electron or and colliding with it. So this distance is known as the mean free path. And the mean free path is actually very easy to calculate. It's given by one over n sigma. Sigma here is the cross section of the stuff, um, or of the constituents of that fluid. Uh, so it could be um, electrons, it could be um, atoms or it could be molecules and n is your number density typically in the ism n is about 100 particles per cubic centimeter and sigma is around one nanometer say what that leads to is or like one nanometer squared so the radius of your particle uh, mostly molecules or atoms there. Uh, if you look at the Bohr radius, it's like 10 to the minus 10 meters, right? That's 10 to the minus. Yeah, and molecules are slightly bigger. So let's say they're as for an order of magnitude estimate, they're, they're like one nanometer. What that leads to is if you just plug in the numbers, you'll have one over 100 times 10 to the minus 18. So that will give you. Or 10 to the minus four, 16 centimeters uh, because you need to convert it into centimeters then you'll get somewhere around 10 to the 14 centimeters so the mean free path in the ism is around 10 to the 14 centimeters and the system size that we deal with is a few parsecs and a parsec is about 10 to the 18 or three times 10 to the 18 centimeters. Uh, so 30 parsecs is around 10 to the 20 centimeters. So it's pretty safe to say that this criteria of mean free path being smaller than the system size is satisfied. So we can treat this gas as a fluid. And what that implies is that it, it obeys the equations of fluid mechanics. Um, and these equations are is the conservation of mass equation, the conservation of momentum, and the conservation of energy. There's also another equation that I haven't written here that is also used. Uh, if you look at this variable phi here, that's the gravitational potential. And the way it's found out is by solving the Poisson equation, uh, which is this. But I'll leave that aside for now. So 
Uh, focusing on the fluid equations, you can see that these look a bit complicated. Um, if you look at this equation in particular, uh, it's three different equations. They're usually written in uh, tensor form or in matrix form, sorry. Uh, these equations are known as the Navier-Stokes equations. And if you can solve these equations, you can get a for some initial conditions, or you can prove stuff about them, uh, because these are very um, poorly understood mathematically. You can, you have a shot at like getting a one, getting a one million dollar Millennium Prize. Okay, so fluid mechanics in general is very poorly understood in physics, and in engineering, people still have done a lot of work and can understand it, but uh, from a purely physics and mathematics point of view, uh, fluid mechanics is uh, very poorly understood. Okay, uh, and the reason for this mainly is that you have partial differential equations that describe your evolution of your system, and it's hard to do too much analytically. So, you can only, so what people generally do is they start with some idealized conditions uh, and they come up with some interesting choices of variables which can lead to uh, these PDEs becoming ODEs. And then you can solve for those ODEs easily. And these are known as cell similar solutions, but I won't go into detail about what they are. But these are, uh, it, it can be, uh, understood in some limits and in some idealized limits. Okay, so since they're so difficult to understand in more detail analytically, uh, we need to usually solve these PDAs numerically on a computer. And therefore you have the whole field of computational hydrodynamics. So we've sort of covered what the physics is that describes this region maybe, but Actually, no, there's more. There's magnetic fields in these regions. And the slide is just meant to sort of um, give you some evidence that magnetic fields exist in the ISM. Um, there are a few ways that people use to look for magnetic fields. One is using Faraday rotation, and there's Zeeman effect, and there's synchrotron emission. So Faraday rotation is what happens when light passes through a magnetic, magne magnetized plasma. If you have linearly polarized light, it comes out the other side having rotated a bit. And this angle is dependent upon your strength of the magnetic field. For the Zeeman effect, you can have, uh, when you have magnetic fields, certain molecules and atoms, they can uh, have a splitting of their uh, orbitals or electronic levels. And you can try to estimate what the, and that also depends on the strength of the magnetic field. And you can observe the spectra of these regions and then try to come up with ways to identify what the strength of the magnetic field in these regions is. There's another way using synchrotron emission. What people do is uh, the basic concept behind synchrotron emission is that electron, uh, electrons or protons in a charged particles of any kind actually, they will evolve in a helical, they will have, an, have a helical motion in, uh, in the presence of a magnetic field. And when you have a helical motion, you have the velocity vector changing with time, uh, you have acceleration and acceleration, accelerating charges produce radiation, which can be seen using telescopes on Earth. And the image on the right, for example, this one, is showing polarized. Uh, so this is, this is showing the magnetic field in the galaxy. This is the galactic plane. I hope you can see this, yes. And the drapery pattern that you see is uh, the orientation of a component of the magnetic field. Um, you can see in the plots on the bottom right, these are for some 
star forming regions. This is the pipe nebula on the left and the Musca molecular cloud on the right. And you can see that there are magnetic fields that are present here. Uh, people use, uh, so the way this was done by, was using polarized thermal dust emission. Uh, if you want more, you can read up on that, but I won't go into detail. The main point to take away is that magnetic fields are there. And the strength of the magnetic field is about five to 10 microgauss. The implications of there being a magnetic field is that you now have to solve the equations of magnetohydrodynamics. Instead of simple hydrodynamics, you need to solve the equations of magnetohydrodynamics. And you have extra terms, extra equations, which complicates things. Uh, for example, you have this equation and also this equation that you need to now solve. Uh, this is just a statement that there is no magnetic monopoles in the universe. And this is the statement that magnetic fields or, or the equation on the right governs how uh, your magnetic field evolves with time. Uh, it turns out that the second equation, delta B is equal to zero, is very difficult to solve numerically. So it presents a challenge, uh, but that's the main uh, thing to take away from there. So we've kind of figured out that fluid mechanics and magnetohydrodynamics especially are, is required to describe these regions. Uh, but there's also still more to go. There's turbulence. So when do we consider a fluid to be turbulent? And you can use the chat to like, just say an answer, or type in an answer. And I'll give like 30 seconds or so, so that people can write something. Reynolds number. Reynolds. Yep. That's, that's correct. We use Reynolds number to find out when a fluid behaves in terms of a laminar flow or when there is a turbulent flow in the fluid. The Reynolds number is found to be, uh, is given by LV times the viscosity. L is the system size. So L is about 10 to the 20 centimeters, right? Nu is given as two times the RMS velocity in these regions. Let's just consider it to be the sound speed for now. Keeps, yeah. And then the mean free path, as I discussed, is, L is this, the mean free path is about 10 to the 14 centimeter, 10 to the 12, doesn't really matter in the end. CS is about 0.2 kilometers per second. And velocities typically in these clouds are 10 times the sound velocity. So velocity is about at one kilometers per second. And one kilometer per second is like 10 to the five centimeters per second. CS is 10 to the four centimeters per second. So when you plug in the numbers, what you get is 10 to the 20 times 10 to the five divided by CS, that is 10 to the four times the mean free path. Get the Reynolds, you get a Reynolds number that is in the range, like 10 to the seven to 10 to the nine or something like that. So it's pretty safe to say that this flow in the ISM is turbulent. Uh, and you can see on the figure on the right, so sort of this boundary between laminar flow and turbulent flow lies in uh, when you have like a Reynolds number of say around greater than 3000 or so, uh, you, you get turbulent flows. Uh, but this number 10 to the seven or 10 to the nine is really, really large. And you, it's safe to say that you have turbulent flow here. And the consequence of this is that you no know, turbulent motions or random motions, unpredictable. They are predictable, but you, know, you can't really study them very well. You can only study them statistically in a statistical sense. And there was this theory by a Soviet mathematician, Andrei Kolmogorov, 
which explains subsonic turbulence very well, but we're not concerned with subsonic turbulence because these flows in these molecular clouds, they're often supersonic or mostly supersonic uh, and supersonic turbulence is not very well understood. There's still a lot of active research going on in that field. Okay, so maybe we've figured out all the parts that describe uh, all the physics that you need to describe these regions, uh, but there's still a bit more to go. There's feedback from stars which form, uh, and you can see on the figure on the right that there are these objects known as herbic Harrow objects, which are essentially just stellar jets. When stars form, they tend to accrete matter, and similar when similar to how you get quasars, when you have black holes that accrete a lot of material, they tend to power these ener very energetic events uh, known as quasars. And similarly, for star stellar systems, you have uh, very energetic jets and outflows. If you look at the map on the or the figure on the left, it shows a uh, a stellar jet use this is i think co emission and the contours sort of represent different velocity um, velocity levels and in general the main takeaway to take from this figure is that uh, you have jets which can be around 60 or so uh, kilometers per second that's significantly um, higher than the sound speed in that region. So these are very energetic jets that uh, shape how your molecular cloud forms and evolves. And this is not the only type of feedback from stars. There's also a lot of other things that go on. For example, there are stellar winds so stars periodically, like the sun, you know, they produce stellar winds. Uh, they just eject material and that goes into the ISM eventually, uh, if stars do that early on in their, in their lifetime, then you have, is my voice lagging? No, it's not, okay. it's only fine. If you have, um, stellar winds uh, early on in your uh, in, in the lifetime of a star, then uh, that can affect your how your GMC uh, evolves and how next generations of stars evolve. Right? There's also heating from the newly formed stars. They can ionize. Uh, they produce photons and they can ionize the surrounding regions and blow a hole sort of in the GMC. There's also supernovae that we need to take care of. So the image on the right shows the crab pulsar, the crab nebula. There's a pulsar at the center, which is a remnant of the of this explosion. This was seen like a thousand years ago by uh, Chinese and Native American astronomers at the time. So it was a very energetic event, or it was at least recorded by those people. And that's how we know today that there was something like this. Um, the supernova, they're usually massive stars that die. They go supernova and then leave off a, a neutron star or a black hole. And the most massive stars, they only live for about like four mega years or so. The more massive your star is, the more, uh, the faster it will consume its fuel, the more luminosity it gives out and they typically last for only four mega years and four mega years is not a lot on the time uh, on the time scales that these GMCs evolve. You can very well have feedback, uh, supernova feedback that sort of sculpts your uh, GMC or molecular cloud. Then you also have to take into account radiation pressure. It's also a form of feedback that will blow around the gas so maybe we've now figured out all of the physics that describes these regions. No, there's still a bit more.
there's photons that we need to take care of. And photons behave, or, or uh, typically how this is uh, described is using the radiative transfer equation. This radiative transfer equation is basically just describing if you have a beam of photons, um, how much of that beam changes with time. That's this term. So you can have uh, photons that can scatter into your beam. You have photons that could get absorbed because of some material and vanish. So those are these terms. And then you can have emission from uh, atoms and molecules that can contribute to this beam. And you also have scattering that will uh, reduce photons out of these beams out of this beam. So as you can see, this is an integral differential equation. There's a partial, there's a, a d by dt, and there's an integral in the same equation. Uh, it's difficult to solve numerically. Um, and that's because it's also to do with the fact that the time scales for the, these phenomena, so hydrodynamics equations or the gas flows, they evolve on the time scales of millions of years, but your Atoms and molecules, they produce uh, emission all the time, they produce photons all the time that can yeah, sort of affect how your GMC is. And so that needs to be taken into account. Um, so this is broadly what the physics is that describes these regions. And now we're at the end of, the f of like two thirds of the talk and I'll take questions. Yeah, sure. I'll read them. So, mm -hmm. okay. so Jayesh Pandey is asking, uh, could there be GMCs that are purely made of H2? Uh, then if yes, then those clouds won't be visible, right? Um, yes, if they're like at 10 Kelvin or so, they won't be. But uh, you typically never find GMCs that are just hard, made of hydrogen. Or molecular hydrogen. So uh, maybe that, early on in the universe. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, that's what we wanted to point to. Early on in the universe. Yeah, you could have uh, when when it's not enriched with uh, metals yet, or um, metal-like molecules, CO or so. Uh, then you probably could have GMCs that are just H two, but uh, you can't really see them, I guess, anyway in other galaxies. So it doesn't matter. So then one can't really understand the population three stars uh, formation rate? Or can There's some other ways to understand population three stars. Um, usually, um, the, we only use GMCs to study nearby uh, stars and galaxies because we can't really image uh, galaxies that are very far away uh, with good resolution. Okay. So we do have a good handle then on the star formation rate in population three then, right? Sorry, we do have a good handle on? The value for the star formation rate in population three, do you say that or? Uh... Um, I don't know if you do. It's still, it's still a field that's evolving and um, there's still a lot of things that uh, people need to understand before uh, they can reliably uh, say that you know this is what star formation rate is for population three stars. But so it, it's it's I mean there have been a lot of studies done before which look at you know how population three stars affect uh, your reionization and how it affects. Um, other early galaxy evolution, but I don't know if, I don't know, basically. The next question is from Atava Bhaika. He's asking, does the H present in these molecular clouds have spin, like para H? Um, yes, I think there's two types of hydrogen molecules, like para and ortho, and none of them are have uh, any emission that we can observe. Okay. And the next question, like, uh, 
it's from from me so i wanted to know uh, when you're doing this radio transfer calculations right you don't really solve the full boltzmann equation so uh, yeah. what do you do do you also take some approximations like moments yep. or some okay yeah and, um then what about the opacities do you take a gray opacity an average opacity or uh, you do some uh, binning of uh, this frequency of photons and then uh, see how the opacity varies with respect to frequency something like that um so uh, people do work on radiative transfer in these simulations but for my simulations i haven't really worked on that yet i will do in the future so i'm not sure if i'm like the best person to answer that question yet uh the next question is from jay spande i recently read a paper on star formation which emphasized on the cloud cloud collision triggers can that process be categorized into turbulence or it's some other parameter yes so it can be understood as uh, turbulence when you have uh, cloud cloud collisions they can sort of trigger star formation uh, because you form over densities in some regions uh, and it can be modeled uh, using turbulence so in your simulations when you perform simulations you can try to uh, check how the the way we i mean ter, this whole business of studying turbulence is very uh, complicated and uh, you need to there there are some simplifications like some parameters uh, that you can sort of measure observationally and also implement in your simulation for example if you have some gas in a box or if you have a water in a bucket you, know, you can drive turbulence uh using a solenoidal motion where you circle your hand around or you can have compressive motions where you go from one end of the bucket to the other end and everything else could be understood as a combination of these two fundamental types of motions so you come up with some parameters that can characterize these motions and then you try to study um how cloud cloud collisions would affect uh this parameter or how radiation would radiation that is impinging upon a cloud would affect how this parameter is uh if, in in observation or in real molecular clouds and then you can try to uh, simulate similar types of conditions numerically on a computer yeah so i myself have two questions uh, one is uh, if i remember correctly the typical uh, scale of these molecular clouds is around 10 to the 20 cm right um, so what is the finest resolution that you go in terms of your simulations yeah so i'll come to that uh, i'll describe my simulation in like the next section okay. um, we go up to like 100 au or so in my ones but there is also a lot of other simulations which go to Uh, around like one AU or so, okay. and uh, so I don't think uh, magnetic rotation instability would occur in these clouds, right? Because the magnetic field strength is so low. Only one can expect uh, Kelvin Hill movement. Right? Um, so magnetic uh, rotational instabilities are like kind of the thing that drive these jets, as far as I know. Uh, so these do happen. Uh, but it's it's not certainly not a hundred percent like well understood what drives jets. No, um, I don't mean the jets where, but not the feedback side of things where the jets are. Uh, but if suppose you take uh, if you remove jets from the system and if you just take the uh, regular. Yeah, if you just have like no jets, um, just star formation and like a turbulent self gravitating medium. Yeah. then you don't uh, or with magnetized i don't think you do but i could be wrong i mean uh, i'm not uh, like a fully formed expert yet i'm still in the process i guess so guys if you have any more questions you can put them to the chat or click on yes and i'll unmute you and you can ask the question i'll give some 30 seconds or so
Okay, should we move on then? But, uh... Yeah, let's move on. Okay, so till now we've understood um, how, what the physics is that describes these equations uh, or these systems. Um, we want, we've kind of have had an idea that it's not easy, sorry, it's not easy to understand fluids. Um, there's radiation that we need to take care of. The ISM is turbulent. It has magnetic fields. And also stars are crybabies. Since we're looking at baby stars, these baby stars tend to throw th things out of their pram um, with jets and feedback, other forms of feedback. So the second part of the motivation for understanding star, how star formation works is to understand how magnetized fluids work and also to understand how supersonic turbulence works, among other things. Okay, so next, uh, how do we systematically study star formation? The way we do this, I mean, there's one way without doing simulations, there's just using analytical calculations in idealized conditions. Uh, those calculations, while they're not perfect, they also help to give you a sense of the system and give you a lot of insight into uh, the problem. But to understand star formation in detail, you need simulations. Uh, what, what I mean by simulations is just that you discretize your equations and you put them on a grid and you evolve that system using some initial conditions. So people use uh, hydrodynamic solvers to solve these fluid equations. And there are publicly available codes that do this. Some examples are Flash, Ramses, Pluto, Gadget, Gizmo, Aripo, there's tons of them. Uh, so th these codes solve your fluid equations and you can uh, put in prescriptions for how your feedback works, uh, how your turbulence is driven in your simulation. And you can come up with a approximate with an approximate uh, approximation to how real molecular clouds behave uh, for radiation typically it's done in either post processing or you can approximate that equation in some conditions and then you can uh, use that to solve your to to evolve your system uh, but a, a problem here is the initial conditions what do we choose as our initial conditions for a cloud? Now, ideally, you would like to simulate the whole universe. You would like to have things start from scratch, uh, and then you, you have cosmological perturbations that grow and form these first stars, then they form galaxies, and then they, those galaxies have stars within them, and you are able to simulate everything. But you can't do that. Uh, because it's computationally impossible. You can't even go from like simulating a galaxy down to planetary scales. The most you can do is get to the GMC scales. So about a few parsecs. That is what the state of the art galaxy formation simulations, like the Eagle simulations, the fire simulations and so on, they, they've been doing. Um, but typically what people do to come up with just simulating these molecular clouds is you either start with a, a sphere, which is like a gross spherical cow approximation, but it is what it is. You start with a sphere and you give your gas random velocities and then you let that system evolve. The other way to do this, which, uh, is what I do in my simulations is by having these, uh, having gas in a box and then sort of having some density structure initially and then putting an imaginary hand in the box and stirring that box around or in, in terms of like solenoidal motions or compressive motions. So like similar to the analogy with the bucket, you either stir it or you have, you drive it back and forth and then you do this without gravity for some time till your turbulence is developed, and then you start to, uh, and then you switch on gravity and 
uh, evolve your system from there. Something to note is that these simulations is, are, are very computationally expensive. So they always uh, have to be run on supercomputers. Uh, if for a sense of how much time it takes to run these simulations uh, or how much resources. Uh, so it takes about 1 million CPU hours. What that means is that if you have one CPU, it will take a million hours to run on that. A million hours is like around 20 years. If you have, say, one million CPUs, you can run it in one hour. But what we do is we have about like two, 250 or like 500 CPUs that run it in like 1 million divided by 500 hours. Okay. So um, now I want to show you some of my movies. I'm going to, oops, I'm going to stop sh uh, sharing my screen and start sharing my screen from my laptop. Uh, okay. So you can hear this, right? Or you can hear me and see this, right? I can, we can hear you, I can see, but there's nothing playing, yeah. Uh, yeah, okay, cool, there should be now. Yeah. So this is a simulation, if I go back to the start, uh, I will evolve it, there's no gravity at this point. There's only turbulence and we're driving turbulence, we're running an imaginary hand through the box. And then after some time, we switch on gravity, and then you start to have stars that will form. So you have one single particle, which is a star particle. Uh, so if here. I may interject, Shivan, uh, what are the boundary conditions for this such a simulation? Yeah, so we use, in this simulation, we use periodic boundary conditions. So you will see that stuff that goes out from here will come back from here. Okay. Uh, there is another star, star that, that is forming. There's another over here. These simulations uh, right now, they don't have magnetic fields or feedback. So there's just turbulence and just gravity. And we do that so that we can understand at least the basics first properly and, and compare it with our analytical models. So these simulations, uh, as you can see, it's like a two part seg box here on each side and the resolution that you have. These simulations are adaptive mesh refinement simulations. What this means is that you have a mesh that is that can refine wherever you have more density or you can set some criteria on where to uh, have more resolution elements and where to not. So this was uh, a simulation where the Mach number these simulations, which is the typical turbulent velocities divided by the sound speed. That's about five for this simulation. And I'll show you another one where the Mach number is 10. So that simulation is much more, it will have much more shocks. And it also forms much more stars. So you have a triple star system maybe, and there's an other star. There's a whole bunch of stars here, and there's like a filamentary structure that's forming, which will form more stars. So over here you have a cluster of stars. And like hundred stars in this simulation actually, something like that. Yeah. Okay, but these simulations are on parsec scales. Um, I also use some simulations that are galaxy simulations, like 
the fire simulation. So this is a galaxy simulation and it's just a static snapshot and a flyby through a snapshot. So this is a Milky Way like galaxy. And it looks really nice. So is this a color scheme based on density or something or uh, nothing? Like yeah, that? They, they do some funny things here. They uh, model what actual, I mean, if you have some stars, what they would look like. Um, it's not a simple color scheme, color map, like you would find in the other simulation that I was showing. Here's another simulation of uh, a Milky Way like galaxy that is colliding with a satellite galaxy. And you have this gas expelled and and so galaxy is rotating and it all looks very nice. There's more gas that's falling into this. Okay. So now I'm going to switch back to my iPad. Can you see anything? I can't see. Not yet, it's green broadcast. Yeah, if I'm stopping sharing screen. Wait a second. And so what can you see? Is it the web no. page? No, we can't see anything. This is so weird. Yeah, now okay, you I see the web page, right? Yeah. Now, if I stop sharing, okay. I can't seem to go back to my original screen somehow. Okay, I'm going to start sharing screen here. Can you see the slides? Yeah, we can. Okay. So this was a simulation that I was showing you earlier, right? This is, um, a f it's called the FIRE simulations, the FIRE project. It stands for Feedback in Realistic Environments. Um, and these are galaxy simulations that are effectively cosmological, embedded in effective cosmological boxes. And what I'm interested in studying is uh, how GMCs form and evolve and their properties. So uh, if you can see on the image on the right, there's these white circles. And there's also blue dots. The blue, so the white circles first are uh, the GMCs that are identified using some criteria in some code. And the blue circles are those GMCs which have newly forming stars within them. And the red ones are actually just star forming uh, particles, which are not embedded in some GMC. But you can see here that if I zoom into one of these GMCs, it looks like these things. So this doesn't look like a circle at all. It's not a sphere. No. And this is not a sphere either. This is a bit more spherical and so is this, but they all come in different shapes and sizes. So it, you really need to take care of um, 
these structures uh, because these would be your initial conditions for um, star forming regions and that is what I'm working on and will be working on in the future. So trying to understand how these GMCs evolve and what their properties are. Can we uh, explain uh, some problems in star formation uh, using that? And I'll come to that in a minute. So there are some important questions that people try to understand. You know, we've developed all this formalism till now. Uh, but what are the questions that we want to answer? So the star formation rate, this is an observed fact, the star formation rate and the star formation efficiency uh, in, these, in, in these star forming regions in the galaxy, it seems to be very low. And part of the reason has to do with that you have gravity, but you also have stellar feedback and turbulence and magnetic fields. So these are processes which oppose uh, gravity and prevent gravity from doing its work and forming stars. Um, but that's not the whole picture. There's still, uh, it doesn't explain uh, some other problems uh, which people are working on, including myself. And it's also not clear if the star formation rate is, uh, this is where, you know, if the star formation efficiency is the same uh, for all regions, so star form, by star formation efficiency, what I mean is just the mass of the stars that form divided by the mass of the stars plus the mass of the gas. Uh, it's observed to be like around 1%. So all these GMCs only convert 1% of their mass into stars before they're blown away and destroyed. Uh, and this 1% is a puzzle, uh, but it's also a, a, a kind of un, fairly well understood puzzle, but there are still some problems. And uh, then another question that is important is that how long do these GMCs live for? Do they live for like 10 mega years? Do they live for 100 mega years? So these are still questions that people are working on. Uh, and the consensus is that it's more like these GMCs live for only about 10 mega years. So star formation proceeds very rapidly and it's very inefficient. And then of course we have uh, the question that do the GMC properties determine the star formation rate uh, of that cloud or the IMF. And there's also some other questions like which analytical models that we can come up with, uh, which of these are the best analytical models. Uh, so we can use simulations to compare uh, different analytical models. Uh, there's also a lot of controversy regarding the IMF. You know, uh, most observations tell us that it is universal. It's the same in um, wherever we look, at least in the Milky Way. It's pretty much the same everywhere. So uh, we want to understand if it is universal and why is it universal, what it is, and uh, how can we describe the shape of the IMF, the peak of the IMF. So the IMF, remember, was the histogram of stars. And it has a log normal with a peak and then it follows a power law distribution in masses. So how can we, what, what sets the, peak of the IMF and what says the slope of the IMF. And then there are questions like how many companions does your average star have? Is the sun very rare or is it the norm? It turns out that um, most stars actually are in binaries like the multiplicity fraction goes up with mass. So more massive stars are actually uh, more likely to be found in binaries. And some open questions are that um, all GMCs don't convert their star formation uh, or don't convert their gas into stars at the rate of 1%. There are outliers, some do it at 10%, some do it at 0.01%, and some GMCs don't form stars at all. So you know, we want to understand why that is, uh, why there is this discrepancy. Uh, is it because of 
is is there a systematic trend such that you can identify star forming uh, GMCs that have an efficiency of 10%? Uh, do they have higher Mach numbers or uh, some other parameters that are higher? And uh, and is similarly do this do the ones that have uh, an efficiency of 0.1%? Are they why are they so low? Uh, what disrupts them? And so on. Then there's the age-old question of if the IMF actually varies with the environment. And there are claims in the literature that people can find uh, that claim that the IMF actually varies in different galaxies. So there was a paper in 2010, I think, yeah, and that was very strong evidence for uh, variation in the environment. Then we want to understand what physics sets the determines the IMF peak. Like, is it uh, people have mostly found out that uh, more recent, much very recently, this is like stuff that is not even out in papers yet, um, but that jets and outflows seem to determine where your IMF peak will lie. And then there is also the question of how can we study supersonic turbulence analytically. Uh, and numerically as well. Uh, numerically, some of the challenges are coming up with better methods to solve equations and uh, have more accurate answers to questions, have more accurate simulations. Um, and that's about it. Um, that concludes everything I wanted to talk about. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Shivas. So we do have a lot of questions. Uh, so before that, I think my own question, like how much do the simulations typically overestimate the star formation rate? Um, so simulation, it, it depends on yeah, your, the, conditions you take. The, the physics that you put in, but if you put in all of the required feedback, radiation, stellar heating, everything, you get down to like an efficiency of 3%. So you don't quite reach 1%, but you're around 3% in those simulations. Uh, so it's still like a challenge to understand why uh, you get 1% and not 3%, but yeah, it's in the details. But mostly all these different processes which compete against gravity, they each contribute to lowering the star formation efficiency. And what seems and to the, be the most dominant one? Um, so the most dominant feedback uh, method is probably photoionization. So photons that are produced by stars ionizing uh, and blowing away the gas that is around them. Um, that is, as of now, I think the, the most uh, important feedback mechanism, which kind of explains why you have uh, GMCs that live for a very short amount of short short amounts of time. Okay. Uh, and so Shandanu Da, she has a um, uh, couple of questions. Is there any way to try to simulate the real life observations and try to extract the parameters and equations from it? Like, uh, can we start the simulation in present time frame and try to go backwards correctly using perturbative methods and then obtain the initial values and parameters? Okay, uh, for the second question, if I can repeat the name of the boundary conditions, it's periodic boundary conditions, because that's one, that question is easy to answer. Um, but for the first question, so if I understand correctly, you're asking that, can we simulate real life observations in simulations, that's what we are trying to do? No, I think he's trying to kind of say, uh, supposing we have the current observations. Yeah. Can you trace back the initial conditions? So he's saying. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. So get an exact exact match and go back in time. Exactly. Um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, people have not done that before. Uh, I've never seen any work like that. Uh, maybe because it's hard, but I am working on. Um, getting more realistic initial conditions. So uh, we're not using real life observations, but we're using 
clouds uh, in galaxies and just picking out those clouds going back in time uh, to get the initial conditions for those GMCs and then re-simulating it uh, forward in time at higher resolution, which is not offered by the galaxy simulations, of course. Okay. Uh, next, Vandana is asking, what determines the rotation of a star? Are the directions random for different stars? Okay, so the reason you have stars rotating is because you have angular momentum that's still, uh, like if you have initially some angular momentum um, in your gas, it will, when it collapses, you will conserve angular momentum, but you also lose angular momentum because an effect call, called magnetic breaking where your magnetic fields can uh, try to pull apart your gas and sort of act as brakes to resist you from forming disks. Um, but uh, you still have some angular momentum that's left over. And that is why you have stars rotating when they're born. They always rotate. And are the di directions random for different stars? So I don't know if they are random or like if there are different stars, definitely at different points in their life, they rotate at different speeds um, or like different periods of rotation. Um, because eventually as time goes on, stars lose mass and they uh, reduce their uh, rotation period or rotation speed or increase their rotation period, sorry. But I don't know if uh, what it looks like for different stars in our galaxy or something like that. I don't know. So Divya Chitibari asked uh, regarding the picture you showed regarding the protoplanets, uh, the recent picture. Uh, so he's asking why is it so hard to find them? Oh, um, the reason for that is you don't have resolution uh, or earlier before this telescope called ALMA you did not have the required resolution to probe these objects. So that picture that I showed before is like at 160 parsecs or so um, away from us. And the only way that you can see these things are with new telescopes. So uh, stuff like ALMA, and the VL very long baseline interferometer, I think that's what VLBI. Uh, that's what you can use to uh, probe like these systems in very good resolutions and get amazing pictures like this one. That's why people have um, found it hard to do that before because you didn't have the technology. Okay, next question. There's well, I think Karen before Steve. that, uh, yeah. so we have some raised hands since a long time. Uh, you have some what? Sorry. Raised I was, hand. Okay. Oh, raised hand. Okay. Sorry. So, Fakre, uh, you can unmute yourself and ask the question. Ismaili. I've given you the permission. You should be able to unmute yourself and ask the question. Okay, never mind then. Let's go to the question in the chat. Okay. So the current what is the current state of computation in sim in simulating approximately and fast so as to test more initial conditions? That's a good question. Um, currently, you can't do very many simulations, uh, but people do work on, like people have tried out different initial conditions and it seems that it doesn't really affect things too much, uh, but it, uh, no one has uh, done a very systematic study in like doing like maybe hundreds of simulations. Uh, with different, different initial conditions and then uh, 
doing some statistical uh, study on that. So that's still pretty expensive. Like if one, si one simulation, for example, costs you like 0.5 million CPU hours, you can't really do much. Typically people can, like, for example, the compute time that my group has on, uh, the, on, on Canada's uh, Synet supercomputer uh, is around like 1 million CPU hours. And that's why I can't really do, like people usually can't really do much beyond uh, just simulating things in more detail. Like you can add, try to add more physics and that will get, get you more to more realistic answers. Uh, even though your initial conditions are completely idealized. But yeah, that's that's kind of the state of things. Shivan, maybe I cut you off. Maybe you can briefly say about these resources. Uh, oh, um, so I was just saying that uh, you can't really do hundreds of simulations and it's very computationally expensive. No, no, I was talking about the resources yeah. here. Oh, the resources um, on this page. So there's this book by Mark Crummels, who's a supervisor of mine called Star Formation that covers a lot of things that I've talked about in much more detail. Um, there is, if you want to understand the fluids of, the physics of fluids and plasmas, you can look at this excellent book by Arnab Rai Chaudhary, who's a prof at IASC. Uh, there's also another book by him that is uh, useful, that's Astrophysics for Physicists. And if you want to look at some review articles, and if that's your thing, then you can look at uh, this article called Big Problems in Star Formation by Mark Trumholz in 2014. That's a bit outdated because it was six years ago. Um, but it still captures or explains things very well and it's useful for someone who wants to get a step in uh, into the field. And then there's also molecular cloud life cycle, a review article that came out recently that people can look at if they want to, to understand how uh, the, life cycle, the life cycle or the physical process that shape these molecular clouds and how that works. Okay. Yeah. So guys, if you have any more questions, you can either put them in the chat uh, or uh, raise hands. Ismail, do you want to ask a question? You unmuted yourself. Okay. Yeah, Anything? small changes in physics of the coding can affect the outcome a lot, yes. But you need to put in right input uh, physics for uh, so for example if you are modeling supernova feedback in a galaxy simulation uh, you need to do that correctly uh, at least you need to put in the right energy uh, range if a supernova produces if you know that it produces like 10 to the 51 ergs or so then you need to put in some conditions that say that if you have stars that live for this long, um, then you pre like inject energy and momentum uh, off around this value with near, nearing, nearby cells. Uh, and yeah, you need to, uh, it, yeah, the, the outcome of the simulation is dependent upon uh, all these things. Uh, yes, uh, on an annual basis, we are on an annual basis. But that's just for my group. The, I, I use some other uh, supercomputers as well, like in Australia, and they've got much more compute time. So they there are also more a lot more members in those groups, so they have a lot of compute time. Okay, Jayesh Pandey raised his hand. Hello, am I audible? Yeah, yes. Yeah, so I had a question regarding IMF. 
so the initial mass function does it dictate how a star will form from gmc right like uh, the whole evolution pattern uh huh so if if it does dictate that then it shouldn't be like universal because if star formation would be like uh, dependent on that then uh, there are yeah, so, variety of uh, evolution yeah yeah so uh, there are um, there should be like if you have very extreme environments you should get different imfs maybe but actually the physics that sets the imf uh, actually can be independent of uh, of the environment as well so you can uh, have say if every star that forms can accrete for only uh, can accrete only say one solar mass uh, and if you have a distribution of stars you know it can it will always tend to be in some uh roughly the similar kind of shape and peak uh, of the distribution will be there but um, there are a lot of claims for variation in the imf but so far like none of those are very very well accepted in the community uh, mostly because of the uncertainties of all involved in measuring the imf so if you want to uh, like go into more detail about how the imf is measured and how uh, you can how you can get a universal imf or a environmental de- dependent imf then you should look at uh, i think section 2 of this or section 3 uh, of this uh, review article and it and does a good job in explaining uh, all of this hey guys we'll wait for 30 more seconds and see if there are any questions okay uh, thank you shivan like thank you very much i really enjoyed the talk i think everyone enjoyed the talk too uh, like thank you for taking out your like time of your busy schedule and giving this uh, i'm no problem my pleasure um thanks a lot for organizing this and good luck for the rest of